Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 17. Let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Let's go to Matthew chapter 17. It is our custom to stand as we read the Word of God. So I want to invite you to stand one last time. This is the last time I'm going to ask you to stand. And then every time you stand after this will be by the leading of the Holy Spirit. But just for a moment, I want to invite you to stand on your feet for the reading of the Word of God. We're going to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Somebody say, I love his word. I love his word. Father, we love your word. Feed us. Satisfy us. Fill us until we want no more. Matthew chapter 17. When you got it, let me know you got it by saying, I got it. Let's start reading at verse number one. Matthew 17, verse number one. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter. And after six days, notice that's a space of time. We're going to deal with it in just a moment, but you can't get time without space, and you can't get space without time. It says, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured. He was changed. He metamorphed. He transformed before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto, uh, unto him, unto them, Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. Save Jesus only. For, for the next couple of minutes, this is our third installment of the series, Give Me Some Space. For the next couple of moments in your hearing, I want to minister from the message, Spatial Intelligence. Spatial intelligence. I need you to nudge your neighbor and tell them, I feel myself getting smarter already. Come on, tell somebody that. I feel myself getting wiser already. Come on, tell somebody that. I feel myself getting brighter already. God is about to give us an impartation of spatial intelligence. Before you leave, God's going to make you smarter. Come on, somebody say amen. So, Father, we love you. We bless you. We honor you, and we thank you for your word. Feed us your word until we are satisfied. We bless you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Come on, everybody say amen. Come on, on your way down, take your seat. Tell somebody, I feel myself getting smarter. I feel myself getting smarter. I'm going to know more after today. I'm going to be wiser after today. I'm going to have more revelation after today. God is going to give me spatial intelligence. Now, I need y'all to understand something, that the born-again experience, the salvation experience, is not just spiritual. That's very important for us, to, for us to understand, that when we get born again, the Scripture says that we are translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. 
And I want you to understand that that experience is not just spiritual. We understand that when your nature changes, it's going to have effects even physiologically, physically. You're going to start to change what you wear and how you present yourself, how you walk. You're going to walk with a, with a less degree of rejection. You're going to walk with a less degree of, of, of fear. You're going to walk with a less degree of, of low self-esteem. You're going to start walking different. You're going to start talking different different because salvation has more effects than just spiritual. God doesn't just want you to get more spiritual. God wants you to also get smarter. Hear me, I need you to understand, when you get saved, you shouldn't forfeit your education. You shouldn't get saved and become dumb. Come on now, because some people get saved and lose their common sense. Hear me, just because you saved, just because you got the Holy Ghost, and just because you want to help people, don't mean you pick up people on the side of the road. I'm saved, but I'm not stupid. So when you get saved, this is not just a spiritual upgrade. It's not just supposed to be a mental and emotional upgrade. It should be a physical upgrade. Every part of you should be upgraded when you get born again. The Bible says that we go from faith to faith. We are constantly increasing in faith. God doesn't want you to stay at the level of faith you are on. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. But God doesn't want you to keep the measure of faith you got when you were first saved. He wants you to grow that faith. He wants you to mature that faith so that you go from faith to, so you go from faith to faith. We also go from glory, meaning that you should learn how to enter Deeper degrees, different degrees of his presence. Come on, y'all. Your worship shouldn't still be here. When you first get saved, this is cool. When you first get saved, this is cute. But at some point, your hands should start to... Right? When you first got saved, you were kind of shy. You just say, amen, hallelujah. But the more you grew in the Lord, that hallelujah should have grew to a hallelujah because... God doesn't want you to stay at the level of glory you experienced when you first got saved. It should grow. You should go from glory to what? The Bible says that we go as saints of God. We go from strength to strength. We don't go from strength to weakness to strength. If you yield to the Holy Ghost, every day will yield to you more strength. Amen. The Bible says it like this, that the mercies of God are new. Every morning I get up, I feel stronger. Hear me. Not because I'm younger, but because I'm more yielded. Not because I'm, more, uh, uh, not because I'm younger, but because I depend on the Holy Spirit more and more. Not by power, not by might, but by His See, if you depend on his spirit, you're not depending on your mental and emotional quotient. If you depend on the, if you depend on the spirit, you're not depending on your physical body. Amen. And you will have strength out of nowhere. You will have peace out of nowhere. You will have focus out of nowhere because you're depending on the Holy Spirit. We go from faith to faith. We go from glory to glory. We go from strength to strength. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that we go from Adam to Adam. The first Adam was a man of sin. The second Adam was a quickening spirit. By the first Adam, sin entered the world. By the second Adam, righteousness entered the world. We don't just go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. We go from dominion to dominion, from Adam to Adam. Every day, I'm conquering more of my flesh. I'm going to preach before I leave. Every day, I'm conquering more of my attitude. I'm conquering more of my carnality. I'm conquering more of my natural man. Why? Because I'm going from Adam to Adam. But hear me, God doesn't just want us to go from faith to faith, from glory to glory, from density to density, from dominion to dominion, from Adam to Adam. He also, and I need y'all to write this down, he also wants us to go from intelligence to intelligence. God wants you to go from one level of IQ 
to another level of IQ. I need y'all to understand, when you get born again, your intelligence is no longer a derivative of human wisdom. When you get born again, your intelligence is no longer the byproduct of the books you read or the school you went to. When you get born again, your intelligence becomes a derivative of the Holy Spirit. Y'all, y'all ain't ready. Y'all, y'all ain't ready. The Bible says you have an unction from the Holy One and you need not a man to teach you anything. Because get this, did you know, okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Y'all just looking at me, come on. Come on, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's going to be good before I'm done. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And when you get it, let's look at verse number 9. 1 Corinthians Two, verse number nine. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Look at what it says. It says, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Yeah, how many people heard this Scripture before? Come on, y'all, look at me. Don't, don't continue to read because I don't want you to get the punchline before I give it to you. All right, how many people have read this Scripture before? And we quote it. We say, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God wants to do for you, blah, blah, blah. But we forget the next verse. It says, eyes have not seen, nor ear has heard. But look at verse number 10. Verse number 10 says, but God, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. So when it says, I has not seen. That ain't true. I've seen it. What God is about to do in my life, I've seen it. It ain't happened yet, but I've seen it. How? By the Spirit. I want to preach. Hear me. You ain't heard it. Oh, yes, I have. I heard the words, you are hired. I heard it. Amen. Before I walked into the interview, I heard it. Who said it? The Holy Spirit. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, but God has revealed them by his spirit. Come on, y'all. Look at what it says, verse number 10. It says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Now, this is what we got to look at. For the spirit searches all things. Yeah, even the deep things of God. The spirit was in business before you got your LLC. So you could depend on your mentor, you could depend on your friend, or you could yield to the Holy Ghost. Man, I want to. And the Holy Ghost is a better business teacher than any one of your friends. The Holy Ghost was in the marriage before you. Your hips ain't never been married before. Your hips ain't gonna keep you married. But if you yield to the Holy Ghost and, and, and be led by the Holy Ghost, you can have a strong marriage because the Holy Ghost was married before. Everywhere you're trying to go, the Holy Spirit went before you and searched all things, yeah? Even the deep things of God. Come on, y'all, let's keep reading that scripture. It says, for what man, verse number 11, for what man knoweth the things of a man? I ain't got time. I ain't got time. What things knoweth? For who knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of a man? If I had time, I would teach you. In Genesis chapter 1, God created two different energies masculine and feminine. See, these are energies. You ever thought, how in the world does a gay man know everything about a woman? They ain't never been a woman, but the spirit they're operating in have been a woman. Yes, I, I, don't get offended. I'm just trying to show y'all it's a spirit. I'm just trying to show y'all it's a spirit. Just like a woman, if she's a lesbian, she ain't never been a man, but that spirit has been a man. So if she yields herself to a masculine spirit, she'll do stuff that men be like, bruh, how you knew about that? Because we got the same spirit. 
Hear me, I ain't hating on you, but I want you to be spiritually intelligent. You got to at least know what's going on. Women of God, if, if he keeps calling you one of the bros, that's not a compliment. <laughs> Man of God, if she is willing to be around you and she don't ever flirt, she don't, you just her brother. Because you can't get real feminine next to real masculine and there is no magnetism. Y'all real quiet. That's why a real man ain't got female friends. I'm up. I don't do female friends. Because <laughs> I'm a real man. Talking about female friends. Talking about female friends. Woman of God, if he is your friend, he better have the spirit of a woman, amen. Because he ain't about to be your friend, and he got a man's spirit. You know what a man's spirit? <laughs> That's a dangerous spirit. I'm talking about a real man, a real man's spirit is a hunter. A real man's spirit is a fighter. A real man's spirit is a protector. I don't care. A real man's spirit is a provider. Y'all, a man's spirit want to fix stuff. We don't want to listen to you. We want to fix stuff. So don't talk to us if you don't want us to fix stuff. We ain't there just to listen. We got to fix stuff. You always trying to fix it. I'm a man, bro. Don't try to get me to not be a man. If you want somebody to just listen, find feminine energy. And you ain't going to find that here. If you open your mouth, I'm going to try to close it by fixing something. Just too much. It says, the spirit searches all things. Yeah, come on, y'all. Let's read it. Even the deep things of God, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Look at verse number 11. What, what knoweth the, uh, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might, come on y'all, so we might what? So that we might what? No. It's intelligence. It's divine intelligence. Our intelligence, now that we are born again, is no longer the byproduct of the books that we read or the classes that we have set in. It is now a derivative of our spirituality and our relationship with the Holy Spirit. God wants us to have what we call spatial intelligence. But in order for us to get there, come on, y'all, let's go ahead and take some notes. Amen. There are different types of intelligence. Number one, I want you to write this down. Number one, there is what we call linguistic intelligence. Linguistic intelligence. This is your ability to understand language and to communicate. Your ability to understand words, word association, to put words together. One of the greatest ways that I've learned to study the Bible is through word association. I hear a word, and through the Strong's Concordance, through the Vine's word pictures, I've learned to hear a word and then to connect that word with every scripture that has that word. And you do that through word association. It increases your linguistic intelligence. Let's keep going. You have logistical or logistic. Sometimes this is also called mathematical or mathematic intelligence. It's your ability to put stuff together. Is your ability to add stuff up. The scripture says, before any person builds a tower, let them first sit down and count the cost. Before you date, you should have some, all right, the, the lobsters from, the chickens to divide the three. You should have been able to do this before you got to the restaurant. This is logistical intelligence. You want to date, you got to have some type of base of income. 
Did you think about that before you got the Airbnb and couldn't get the... <laughs> Come on, you got to have logistical intelligence is how to add stuff up. How long are you going to keep letting them do you wrong until you start? One, two... They only call me at 12 o'clock on Saturday. On 12 o'clock on Friday. What? Let me add this. I'm a booty call. That's what that is. You ain't added that up by now? That you're the last option? You ain't added that up by now? Logistical intelligence. Number three, y'all. Musical intelligence. How to keep rhythm. How to keep beat. How to keep your cadence, amen. See, hear me. Most of us start a process, but we are not able to finish the process because we are never able to master the rhythm of the process. Every relationship got a rhythm, amen. I may not see you Monday. You busy on Tuesday, but we're going to connect on Wednesday. I ain't going to see you Thursday. Date night on Friday. Once you master your rhythm, you can find satisfaction. But if there is no consistency in rhythm, there's going to be discombobulation and there's going to be confusion. Let's keep going. You got what we call body intelligence. It's It's also called kinesthetic intelligence. body into is, is, is knowing how to move your body, how to position your body. Sometimes this is called athletic intelligence because most athletes have a, an abundance of kinesthetic intelligence. They might fall, but they know how to fall. Some people fall, break their whole body. I'm talking about they just, uh, just tripped. But some people know how to fall. A just man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. There are some people, they get offended one time, they fall, never get up. Some of y'all been broken again and again and again, and your buoyancy, your bounce back is supernatural, amen, because you got kinesthetic intelligence. Come on, nudge your body, nudge your neighbor and say, from intelligence to intelligence. Come on, tell them that. You're getting smarter, I told you. You have interpersonal intelligence. You got intra, not just interpersonal, but you got intra. Interpersonal is your intelligence between people, between two parties. But then you have intra, intra, that's your ability to know you. And you can only love somebody else the way you love. So if you don't know you, you ain't going to know nobody here. Can y'all do me a favor because I can't reach as far as you can. Can you just look at somebody, get real uncomfortable? See, don't lie to yourself. Stop lying to yourself. Stop lying. Come on now. Come on. You cross-eyed, accept it. Come on. You short, accept it. Amen. Come on, accept it. Because the moment you accept it, God can then give you confidence for it. But God can't give you confidence if you ain't accepted it. I got weak ankles. I got weak ankles. Right now. My edges are going through rehabilitation. <laughs> Intrapersonal intelligence. You also have what we call naturalistic intelligence. Come on, y'all. We got to go. <clears throat> Boy, this is a funny church, I tell you. How you gonna call for an I call? <laughs> you got naturalistic intelligence. Naturalistic. You have teaching intelligence. Come on, y'all. I gotta just roll through here. You got teaching intelligence. You got naturalistic intelligence. You got teaching intelligence. You got what we call existential intelligence. These are three that I added. You have what I call ministry intelligence. Understanding how to minister. First Corinthians chapter 12, there are difference. There's a diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. So ministry intelligence is knowing how to minister to a variety of needs, but having the same heart, having the same spirit, having the same sincerity. This is what we call ministry intelligence. You have prophetic intelligence. Come on, Brian, we got to go. And then you have what I call honor intelligence. 
honor intelligence. But what I want to deal with today is what we call spatial intelligence. Do y'all remember when we were children in grade school and they started to teach us spatial intelligence by playing with shapes? They would give us this little board that had different, different shapes in it. You had a star, you had a triangle, you had a circle, you had a square. And you had to pick up certain blocks and you would try to force the shape into a round hole or into a square hole or into a peg. You would try to force the shape just to learn that certain stuff don't fit. That there is a place for everything. This is what we learn when we learn spatial intelligence. Spatial intelligence teaches us, I want you to write this down, number one, colors. This is where we learn where the stop sign is what? Red. This is where we learn green mean go. Yellow means slow down. All of this is a part of our spatial intelligence. We learn shapes. We learn the difference and how to distinguish between a square and a circle. It taught us how to relate things based on shape. And how when we see similar shapes, how to categorize certain things. Okay? Spatial intelligence should have taught you, don't trust nobody <laughs> that walk like this. See, you should see a liar from a mile away. Because I know that shape. Come on, men of God. Nothing good walk like this. Nothing good walk like this. <laughs> it shouldn't be that tight that you can't take a stride. You can't take a step. It's your ability, watch me, to judge. See, this is what we say. We say, we say, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We say that like it's a negative thing. That's not negative. There are some things you should judge by how it looks. You ain't bringing me my food looking no type of way. I'm not eating that. I don't care what you say. It ain't about how I look. It tastes good. All right, well, you're going to have to make it look good for me to put it. I ain't never heard a woman say, I don't care how the wedding dress look. I just want it to feel good. No, I want it to look good. Right? And so spatial intelligence taught us how to look at certain things. And so they taught us spatial intelligence. Now, there's a few things that I, we, we want to deal with, all right? Because spatial intelligence teaches us a few things. Number one, it teaches us how to look at colors. It teaches us how to judge things according to shape. But then it teaches us how to put things in their proper place. So one of the laws that I want to introduce to you today is what I call space is finite. Everybody say space is finite, all right? The finite area of space is what we call volume. And everything has volume. Your mind has volume. You can only learn so much but before you start shedding information, before you start letting stuff go. Some of y'all don't even remember all the stuff that you went through because you've went through so much stuff, you've had to let certain stuff just to let it go. People tell you, do you remember? You don't even remember. You know why? Because your mind has a volume. Hear me. Your heart. You only got room for like. <laughs> Some of y'all got a big heart. <laughs> Some of y'all got like two, three women, two, three men. You got a huge heart. But how many can you really love, though? How many can you really minister to, though? Right? 
but you got finite volume. Hear me, you can't keep everybody in your heart at the same time. The moment you enter one relationship, somebody gonna have to go, amen. And that is something that we need to learn, that our heart has a finite volume. Hear me, so one day, I went grocery shopping, and my wife hates when I go grocery shopping. I love grocery shopping. God speaks to me. Oh, yes, it is, amen. If I ain't heard from God in a long time, I go, I go to Publix. I used to go to Kroger, but God sound different in Kroger. <laughs> I be in Kroger, God be like, bro, go left, bro, go right, bro. I be like, I go to Publix. He be like, and thou and thee, I say unto thee. <laughs> so I like that guy. I'm going to Publix. <laughs> I would tell y'all how he sounded piggly wiggly, but I can't cuss in here. I can't, you can't cuss in here. <laughs> piggly wiggly Jesus ain't nice, I tell you that. <laughs> but I like to go to, I like to go to the grocery store. And then I found out about Instacart. Oh, she hated. I just wake up and be like, I want donuts. <laughs> I want fruit, whatever. So I, I bought a whole bunch of stuff. I went to the grocery store and I bought a whole bunch of stuff. I'm telling y'all, I was ready to rock and roll. And then when I got all the stuff, I went to the refrigerator to get ready to put my stuff in. And I realized, I ain't got no room in the refrigerator. And so I started to look at stuff that I had in the refrigerator, and I realized I had bought so much stuff last time, I had stuff in the refrigerator that had spoiled, but I had never used. See, and when you don't understand, you got a finite heart, you will have good friends in your life that you've never used. I want to... To the, I went to the refrigerator and I said, Lord, what in the Because hear me, in certain seasons, the only way you can make room for what God is about to do, you got to get rid of what he already done. There are certain friendships you no longer need. Certain relationships you can throw away. Certain stuff that I'm no longer using. Why, why do I still got their name in my phone? They just taking up space. Every time I see it, I block them anyway. I might as well throw them out. You want new revelation? Still got old ideas. You want new revelation? Still got old philosophy. You want new anointing? Still got old practices. When you gonna throw it out? Tell me, I want God to do something new. Still addicted to the old. I want God to do something new. Still filled with the old. I want God to do something great. You still got mediocre in your refrigerator. You ever made a mistake and threw away something you had to go back and be like. <sighs> God threw his coke away. But y'all, I want you to hear me. All I'm doing is making room. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that if you want God to do something great in your life, what God does in your life will be according to the room you create for him. If you want him to do something small, give him small room. But if you want to give him, if you want him to do something big, give him big room. And my God said he will inhabit the praise of his people. So if you want, to, if you want him to do something big, give him a big praise for 30 seconds. Amen. I'm cleaning out my room. I 
I'm telling you, I'm creating room. I want God to do stuff eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, but God has revealed it. Somebody scream, by his spirit. I... I got new stuff to unpack, new gifts to unpack, new anointings to unpack. So in Matthew chapter 17, I'm done, let's go. Matthew chapter 17. Jesus said, Man, I've been ministering. I need to go away for a little bit. Y'all, give me some space, give me some space. I need to go, I need to get refreshed. I need to get restored. And the Bible says that Jesus goes into a mountain apart. Now follow me. He ain't just going to take anybody. He ain't just going to choose anybody. He going to choose particular shapes. He ain't just going to choose anybody. Because I told you. Each one of these shapes represent a different type of friend. The circle represents your mature friend. Now, I need you to follow me, all right? Your circle represents your mature friend. Why? Because they are well-rounded. You need somebody that will see your situation from all sides. They won't take a side. They will see your situation from all. I see your point, but I also... I also see their point. I see why you're upset, but I can see why they would be upset too. Now, you got some people, they don't want you to take all sides. They just want you to be on. I cannot trust your subjectivity. I need somebody that is objective. They don't see through the prism of their emotions. They are well-rounded. You also got... Your square friends, the square friends are your rational friends. These are your analytical friends. When when you tell them what you believe God for, it's not that they don't believe God either, but they're looking for strategy. They want to see a plan. Let me see your profit and loss. They don't want you to just believe God. They see all the problems, all the issues. And you need them in your life, amen. But you got to put them in the right place. You got your triangle friends. These are your neutral friends. These are the people, they usually don't take sides. They're just there to support. The problem with your neutral friends is that they usually become enablers. They'll watch you sin and say nothing. They'll watch you destroy your life and they'll say nothing. Who who am I to judge? And there are certain things you should judge. Not after the manner of it, but after the duration. Now you said you were going to get your life together two years ago and I stuck with you. What you going to do now? You cannot be neutral your entire life or some of your friends will die and never exhaust their potential. At some point, come on, nudge somebody, say, pick a side, pick a side. You're either on the side of my purpose or on the side of my perversion, but you can't be both. Pick a side. You got your diamond friends. These are your diamond friends. These are your high maintenance friends. Their dreams are always bigger than their budget. And they always suggest stuff they can't pay for. I don't know, I don't know. Why don't we go to Cabo? You ain't got, you just asked me for gas money last week. We just want Cabo. These are your high maintenance friends. You need them in your life because they don't allow you to be complacent. 
Hear me, you like your Dodge, you like your Ford, that's great, but they always pushing you to the other level. You ain't seen this Maybach, you ain't seen this Bentley, you ain't seen this Rolls Royce, you ain't seen it, because they're always pushing you to your limit. You need them so that you don't get comfortable where you are. You got your hard friends. These are your empaths. They feel everything. You ain't even got to tell them nothing. They just feel you, they call you. Girl, you all right? Bro, you good? You need them because they can feel your heartbeat, the pulse of your purpose. They can feel when your rhythm is off, when your pattern is off. They can feel when you're depressed, when you're hurting. You need heart friends. They're not analytical. They're not trying to be rational. They're there to minister to your emotions. The Bible says of Jesus that he was moved by compassion. You need friends that are moved by compassion. The Bible says mourn with those that. You can't be mourning and your friend on the phone. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I told you. Hold on, hold on. You all right? God going to be there. Yeah, what we doing? We doing tonight? Tonight? Because you don't, you don't want to go, do you? I know you, I know you don't want to go. You want to stay here. I, yeah, I'm going. Where is your heart? They sitting there hurting and broken, and all you can think about is you? It's gotten real quiet in this Presbyterian oneness, this United Methodist type of church. Got the heart. And then lastly, you got your star friends. I told y'all, these are the ones that wear sunglasses inside. Famous without followers. Damn, they just. And in Atlanta, you got a lot of them. Everybody think they're a star in Atlanta. You got my mixtape, I got a mixtape of you. I get another mixtape. But you got your star friend. Now, here is the problem. When Jesus is going up the mountain, Jesus can't bring all of his friends. He only can bring three. He only got a slot for three. He only got space for three because there are different degrees of intimacy. This is what I call, I want you to just write it down, the privilege of proximity. Hear me, never take it for granted if somebody brings you close. Never take it for granted if, if somebody confides in you, if somebody gives you their secrets and gives you their heart and gives you their darkness and gives you their failures and gives you their weaknesses. Never take it for granted because you have been invited into intimate space. Y'all got to understand, Jesus was 100% fully God, but he was 100% fully man. I was thinking about this last night. I was meditating on this last night. The only way God could ever experience the human experience, he had to become a man. And while God became a man, he enjoyed the experiences of being human. Now, let me tell you something. You know what this did? In all of Christianity, forget Christianity, in all of spirituality, you know what it did when God became a man? He validated the human experience. Nah, man. It is okay to be human. It is okay to hurt. It is okay to cry. It is okay to get mad because God became a man and did all of it. He showed us it was possible to be human and to be holy, to be human and move in our purpose. And our, he showed us it was possible. But just because he was God, did mean he didn't get lonely? Just because he was God, did mean he didn't get tired. And when any of us get tired and get lonely, we need a certain type of friends. I'm going to be honest. At this point, we don't need the stars. Because what happens when I don't feel like a star? See, I don't want a superstar around me when I feel like a nobody. 
they're going to be too detached from that. I need somebody that knows how it feels to feel small unseen, forgotten, and neglected, and that's not a star. So if I'm going up the mountain, the last one I want is a star. Hear me. Last thing I want is somebody neutral. Because you might side with my enemy. So you good for my circle, but you're not good for my ascent. I got to leave you down here at the bottom of the mountain. And man, if you're going hiking, you don't need no high maintenance, folks. Because when you start sweating, they think about their edges. Is it snakes on this trail? I think anybody brought snacks? Ain't got no snacks. We fast and all the way up, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? But them who have clean hands and a pure heart. This ain't for food. This is for our future. Amen. I got to leave you at the bottom. And who do I got left? I got three type of friends that I'm going to take to the top. I'm going to take my mature friend who is well-rounded. I'm going to take my heart friend who understands my heart and my emotions, and I'm going to take my rational friend who is analytical, and they're always going to give me good advice. Now, here's the problem that most of us have is that we got the right people. We just got them in the wrong place. See, your well-rounded friend is the one that should give you advice, not your heart friend. All right? Because your heart friend is always going to try to bend the advice for you. They're never going to be objective. They're never going to be uh, pragmatic. They're always going to make it personal, and they're never going to fit just right. Hear me, hear me. And many of you have tried to fit your heart friend. Into your mature friend's space. You're going to realize they don't give you good advice. You got to put your, and hear me, the last thing you want is your rational friend trying to give you advice. They're going to take God out of the equation, prayer out of the equation, fasting out of the equation. It's going to be all about numbers and analytics. So you might have the right friends, but are they in their proper Place. So Jesus, he says, I need to go up to the mountain. I need to choose three types of friends. But as Jesus begins to ascend the mountain, I want y'all to understand, he begins to walk through every level of intelligence. As Jesus is going to ascend the mountain, he, he needs linguistic intelligence because he has to give them language and instructions and direction for them to follow. As they begin to go up, he has to use logistical intelligence because he has to measure how many miles. They're going to be walking from the base of the mountain to the top of the mountain. He needs musical intelligence because on their way, he's going to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs. They're going to worship as they ascend the mountain. He needs spatial intelligence because he needs to understand how far to be from them, how far they need to be from the others, so that when he tells them something, they don't repeat it to other people that don't need the information. I need to understand space. He understands body intelligence because as he's climbing up the mountain, there's rocks and cliffs and boulders that he must maneuver around so that he don't hurt himself. So he has to use kinesthetic intelligence. He uses interpersonal intelligence because he has to have a good relationship with the people that he's leading. He has intros introspective or intrapersonal intelligence because he has to understand himself while he's ascending up the mountain. He uses naturalistic intelligence because on his way up, there are certain flowers that he can touch and certain flowers that may give him 
crashes, he's got to know what to step over and what to step on in order for him to get to where he's going. So he has to use naturalistic intelligence. He uses teaching intelligence because he's going to disciple, give parables, and give impartation while he's going up the mountain. He's going to use existential intelligence to give them impartation and an understanding of revelation. He's going to use ministry intelligence. He's going to use prophetic intelligence. And he's going to use honor intelligence all while he's going up the mountain. They're on their way up. He got three people with him. He's chosen these three specifically. And now they're on top of the mountain. When he gets to the top of the mountain, the Bible says that he starts to change. Because hear me, you can't change in front of everybody. You can't metamorph. You can change wardrobes, but don't change your attitude. Because some of them, the only reason they connected with you is because y'all had the same spirit. And the moment you start changing your outlook and your perspective and your worldview, they start falling back. Hear me, you can't change in front of everybody. He says, I can't do this in front of everybody. My passion is almost here. I'm about to die. I'm about to give up my life. And I'm going to be honest, I'm starting to feel weak. I need an impartation of strength. Let me go apart to a mountain. I don't want to go by myself, though. I got 12. Can't take Judas. He don't know how to manage precious things. Can't take Thomas. He's been doubting from the beginning. Nathaniel is judgmental. Philip got issues. Bartholomew... I ain't going to lie. Who is Bartholomew? I ain't seen Bartholomew. <laughs> Let me take the cusser. I need somebody that me, that'll tell it like it is. Let me take Peter. James, he's a studier. He's a student of the Word of God. Let me take James. And his brother John loves me like nobody else. John the Beloved. I'm going to take them three, and I'm going to start to ascend. They go up to the top, and the Bible says he starts to transfigure before them. And all of a sudden, in a vision, like a dream, Moses and Elijah shows up. Here goes Peter. Start calculating. Okay, Peter John. Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. And the Bible says that Elijah and Moses were talking to Jesus. This is the problem with relationships, is that from a distance, you can think because they're talking together that they have the same rank. You can think because they're talking together, they are peers. And this is what Peter thought. If they're all talking they must deserve the same level of glory. If they're all talking, they must deserve the same level of respect. And Peter said, why don't we build three tabernacles? One for Moses, one for Jesus, and one for Elijah. But they had no idea what the conversation was. Apostle Bob, I started to pray in my prayer time. I said, Lord, what were y'all talking about? And the Lord opened my ear to hear their conversation. And I heard Moses say, you're the one that we've been waiting for. You're the one that the law talked about. You're the one that we've been preparing for. Thank you so much. I worship you. You know what Elijah was saying? Elijah said, I think I saw this at some point in my lifetime. I looked down the tunnel of time and I saw the Messiah coming in his glory. You are the one we prophesied about. We worship you. Moses was worshiping Jesus. Elijah was worshiping Jesus. I ain't got time 
But for the Muslim in the room, Muhammad was worshiping Jesus. Buddha worships Jesus. And while Peter, as the rational one, is calculating how can we honor all three, God had to speak from heaven and say, wait a second. Why are you creating space for legalism? You want to worship the feast and you want to worship the color. You want to do all this stuff. When I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And you want to heap upon yourselves Jewish laws. It says me and Moses ain't on the same level. Me and Elijah ain't on the same. You think your prophetic word is on my level? Voice said, This is my beloved, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. And then they started to do what Moses and Elijah did. They started to worship. And while they worship, Jesus came. This is an encounter, amen. Because what if I told you that them going up the mountain had nothing to do with Jesus at all? I'm trying to bring you into a place of impartation. I'm trying to bring you into a secret place, a place that you've never seen. Get close. Get close. You want to be changed, you got to get close. You want me to heal you, you got to get close. You want to be delivered? You got to get. And that's, he said, I brought y'all up here one for me. They're crying. He goes over. He touches them. That's the encounter. That's the transformation. That's the impartation. He touches them. And then they open up their eyes. I wish I had time. Just like the man that Jesus prayed for, when he led him outside of the city, prayed for him, he opened up his eyes, they saw trees, he prayed for him again, he opened up his eyes, they didn't see no trees. So, he, he, when he has the encounter, they see Moses and Elijah, but when he touches them, he opens up his eyes, and they see nobody save Jesus only. My prayer for you is that you won't see the problem, you will see Jesus there's not space big enough for your doubt and your faith. Somebody got to get out of the refrigerator. There's no space for who you used to be and for who you're going to be. Somebody got to get out of the refrigerator. Come on, y'all. Stand on your feet. 